Everybody in America just sides with their own people and doesn't look at the facts. The cops mm -hmm. I saw on the news a couple of weeks ago were wearing bracelets or something that said, I am Darren yeah. Wilson. Why do you want to throw your lot in with this plain murderer? And, the, and, 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 and Michael Brown's people. I'm sorry, but Michael Brown's people say he's a gentle giant. Well, we saw that video of where he was in the 7-Eleven. Yeah. No, he wasn't a gentle giant. He was committing a robbery, and he pushed that guy. He was acting like a thug, not like a gentle giant. He certainly didn't deserve to be shot for it. Uh, all right, uh, there is the opinion of, uh, uh, you know him, you love him, or you hate him, Bill Maher. Joining us now, we all love him, is Matt Lewis, senior contributor for The Daily Caller and contributing editor for The Week magazine. Uh, author of a great piece, uh, Untruth and Consequences in Ferguson. And Matt, um, you know, let, let, let's skip to the end of your piece. And, and, and I don't know if you're quoting Jonah Goldberg or, 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 or this is your conclusion, but I don't recall. But uh, it kind of goes along with what we just heard, that uh, this, the cop was a murderer. Uh, no matter what happens, if there's no indictment or if there's an indictment and he's found not guilty, this legend of uh, hands up, don't shoot, whatever, that's going to live on forever, isn't it? It very well could. I think that, you know, we're all susceptible to first impressions. And, you know, and think of politics and political campaigns. If you can define the debate, define your opponent, it's very difficult to change people's minds once, uh, once something has been defined. And I think what we had is in August, we had weeks and weeks and weeks of breathless media coverage coming out of Ferguson, most of which portrayed Michael Brown as a gentle giant. And now, just in recent weeks, we've started to have uh, new evidence uh, come, you sort of leak out that, that implies that something quite different might have taken place. But I think we're still going to be stuck in that original narrative, and, and that may just be how history remembers it. And this original narrative would not be possible if it weren't for a compliant media, a willing media, a, a, almost a, me a media that almost helped in the fabrication of this, this myth before we knew all the facts. Well, I think there's a couple of things at play here. I think that it's probably true that the media, um, you know, I think roots for controversy and divisiveness, and that by virtue of the media descending upon Ferguson, uh, they probably encouraged some of the sort of rioting and unrest that took place there. On the other hand, I think that some of it, frankly, is just a product of the media is covering the information available. And the leaks at the time in August and, and the, the witnesses who were coming forward were telling Michael Brown's side of the story. And the police were largely remaining quiet. Um, and, you know, some of that is just procedurally they, they, they couldn't uh, speak out. And so I think that what happened is that the story, most of the story they got told was told from uh, one perspective, and, and Darren Wilson's side of the story just recently has come out, uh, mostly, I would say, in the form of the autopsy report. Right, the autopsy report, the uh, forensics in the car. I mean, uh, this has been leaked by government sources uh, to the New York Times, St. Louis Dispatch, and others. Uh, but, you know, my problem with the media, uh, you see, the media, in my opinion, should always it, it either be fair or always uh, you know, until proven otherwise, uh, back the cop. I know that would never happen, but I certainly do. I always back the cop unless it's proven otherwise. And especially when the media had access to the video of, of Michael Brown robbing a store and pushing not once but twice a, a, a much smaller man half his size uh, minutes before this encounter with the officer. I mean, that, that certainly was a hint. Yeah, I, I, I think that... Honestly, I think what the media really should do is not to prejudge cases and to let things play out in the court of law and through the rule of law. And so the media was covering a story knowing that, that some of the eviden evidence was being essentially suppressed, that they didn't have all of the information. And unfortunately, I think that's just the nature of the business, that you know, if you don't go cover Ferguson, somebody else will. There's no such thing as the wise old newspaper editor saying, right. we're not going to run with this story because it hasn't been vetted yet or because we haven't heard the other side of the story. You go with the witnesses that are willing to talk, and there's a story there, and you run with it. And it's, it's sort of it's hard to fault any single media organization for doing that. But at the end of the day, you have a situation where I think these narratives set in. That's why I'd like to see the police 
videotape everything. I think it's for their own, for the police's own safety uh, to have these things right. documented. But Matt, now, now, based on your story here and your conclusions, uh, how you know this uh, this legend will live on and whatnot, uh, if there's no indictment, uh, what can we expect in Ferguson? Well, that's that's a little bit of the scary part. There, there's some insinuation that the reason that these autopsy reports have leaked out is to sort of have a preemptive strike to prepare the public that an indictment may not be coming, um, and to essentially launch a trial balloon, which might, you know, dampen down on some of the, the unrest. But look, I think it's, it's, it is, it is a, a reasonable concern and worry that if a grand jury fails to indict Darren Wilson, that there could be rioting once again in Ferguson. I don't think it's absurd to, to worry that that's a possibility. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more, unfortunately. All right, Matt, thank you very much. Always great to talk to you, sir. Thank you for having me. All right, Matt Lewis, senior contributor for The Daily Caller, contributing editor for The Week magazine. And we are going to be coming right back, folks, with more of the Steve Malzberg show with the panel right after the break. But first, you know what we're going to do? With Election Day just six days away, we're going to check in on the Kentucky Senate race with our road to the midterms. Don't go away. Democrat Allison Lundegren Grimes has proven to be a formidable foe against Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell. The two broke out of the gate on the campaign trail neck and neck. Occasionally, one or the other would nose ahead in the polls, but never enough to break away out of that margin of error. Now that the race has entered the home stretch, there's finally an opening for the McConnell campaign. It would appear, according to some political analysts, that national Democrats have all but abandoned Grimes by pulling the plug on their funded advertising. A big blow to her campaign. Grimes may be down, but she's definitely not out. She'll still get help from the National Party with her ground campaign. And there's plenty of money in her war chest to keep up her own airwave assault. Grimes' September filings with the Federal Election Commission show her campaign raised almost $5 million last quarter. Even with her record-breaking numbers, Fox News reports McConnell's campaign has been able to outspend Grimes by tens of millions of dollars thanks to help from the super PACs. 